Thank you. Hey, I used to work in uh, corn soybean systems many, many years ago. The biggest difference between corn and vegetables, I think most of you, if you've worked in both of the crops, is that uh, vegetables usually have uh, much more nervous growers and are much more quick to uh, pull the trigger on uh, fungicides and insecticides compared to corn soybean growers. <laughs> because they fear a wall and they don't want to take any chances on losing any of the vegetables that they're going to make some money on. So I'm going to go over some of the uh, major insects, uh, the ones I commonly see from year to year and a few that have started to pop up in the last couple of years that we did not have a real problem with, let's say five years ago, but now the last two or three years, we're starting to see them more consistent. And I'm going to start with natural enemies. I also like to start with positives. Uh, I've given this talk sort of in the past over the last uh, eight, nine years. And I found that you as a group are very good at identifying natural enemies. So as we go through these, go ahead and speak up if you recognize them. Bob, don't say anything. I won't get it. Okay. Do you recognize this natural enemy? Hey, buddy. Ground beetle. Ground beetle. I know. I know. I'm going to help you move it along. Oh, <laughs> These are carabids, ground beetles. Uh, they're usually, you can see about this size of them on the back of somebody's hand. They're usually dark colored. Uh, they have a, a sheen to them. So if you look at them, they look like they have a, a little rainbow on them because they're so reflective. Uh, these guys you usually don't see uh, in the field very often unless you go out at night. These are night predators and they climb the plants at night and they look for any kind of pest that they can feed them. So these guys are very beneficial. They stay on the ground during the day. They hide under things during the day. And at night, they start to climb the plant. So they come in different sizes. Like I said, the smaller ones can get into all kinds of things. But oftentimes, uh, if we see something damaged in the field or something rotting, and you break it open, you'll see what are actually little crabbits moving out of the uh, damaged tissue. And people think this is what caused the damage. But these guys are actually going after the thing that caused the damage. So that's why it's important to be able to recognize them and know that they're not causing the damage, but they're going after the thing causing the damage. Anybody recognize this one? Usually you'll see it up close like this. Okay, this is a ladybug larvae. One of the most common things you can, you'll find out on the foliage. This is adult. It's all kinds of different sizes, shapes, different colors. They're very, uh, very beneficial. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll come into the field pretty quickly. The females will search the field for anything, you know, aphids, uh, small body insects. Uh, then they'll lay eggs, and the eggs are what you want to see. They're orange colored, usually standing on end. Of course, I didn't put a picture of that in here. Just the larvae. The larvae hatch from these. They're this alligator shape, dark colored with orange or yellow spot. There's nothing else that looks like this larvae wise. A dark purple, black with the orange or yellow spot. Well, that's what you want to look for in the field. Anybody recognize these eggs? I heard... Okay, close. They, they sort of look like it. Very good. These are lace wing eggs. They're always laid on a hair-like stalk. In nature, uh, you either build in or... What? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. In nature, you usually 
two, one of two things. You build in aggressiveness into your offspring, or you build in non-aggressiveness. If you build in aggressiveness, every time one of these, the first egg that hatches, it ends up eating the other eggs that are present. It'll eat everything that it gets to. So lace wings built aggressiveness into their offspring. So they're very aggressive, and they'll go after anything and eat it. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, my. In order to get by this, if this first one hatches, is they put them on these hair-like stalks. So when this first one hatches, it cannot get to these other eggs. So it has to go up this hair-like stalk and go over and start to go down the hair to get to the egg. But when it starts to go down the egg, it finds out there's barbs on this hair that don't allow it to go down. So these eggs are then protected from anything feeding on it. One of the reasons I bring this up is you can buy these eggs, lace wing eggs, and put them out in the field. But they don't come with the hair like stalks on them. They just come with the eggs. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do you think happens when that first one hatches and there's a bunch of eggs laying around? Right? It ends up killing all the rest of the eggs. So I don't recommend that you buy lace wing eggs because it's not going to help you. You're going to end up with 10 lace wing larvae in the field instead of thousands because they're going to eat everything that's near them. So nature has plans, and if we try to intervene there, sometimes it doesn't work out well, real well. Okay, there's the adult. There's the larvae. <coughs> They're usually uh, whitish with uh, dark spots on them. They have these sickle-like mouth parts. You see right here. And you see this half aphid. They'll go after soft-bodied insects, but they'll go after uh, other things like caterpillars. And they'll eat caterpillars, uh, things two or three times their own size they'll consume. OK, anybody recognize this one? Very good. What, what tips you off that that's what it is? What do you see in that picture? Well, I know it's a fly. It's only got one wing. Very good. One set of wings. Um, it just looks like a serpent. OK. Circle slide, mimic. Am I dragging this again? <laughs> Surface flies mimic bees, okay? And, and nature, anything that's yellow or black or orange and black, it's a warning sign all through nature. It says, leave me alone or you're going to be sorry. So surface flies mimic this so that other things leave them alone, okay? So they're easy to spot. This is their offspring or uh, maggots, and this is a predatory maggot. And so they'll feed on the leaf. So you want to look for, a, they don't feed in groups. They feed very singly. So there'll be one on the leaf, and it'll be amongst many uh, other pests that they'll start to feed on. OK, this one's a little more, you, you're not going to see this one very often. Anybody? Go ahead. Is that a wandering fire bug? Very good. Very good. This is aureus insidiosus. This is its larvae or uh, nymph stage. These are not very large, but they're very good at killing thrips. If you have thrips problems, you want to try to get aureus out into your field as much as possible because they'll, they, they'll eat a lot of different things, but they especially like thrips. If thrips are present, they'll go after them. And this is a sunflower. A uh, small headed sunflower, and I took the picture of it so you could see where Aureus was. Anybody see Aureus in that picture? Very tiny, right there. So it sort of gives you the size of, the, of Aureus, and their offspring, the, the nymphs, are about a third that size. And because they're orange, some people think that they're thrips. So you need to pay attention if you start to see the orange things running around in a flower head like this. Uh, this is one biological way that you uh, can encourage uh, 
aureus in a field. You don't want to grow regular sunflowers. You want to grow this sunflower type. And the sunflower type is called a table sunflower. And it produces very little pollen. And the reason you don't want a lot of pollen because the pollen favors the thrips. So the pollen favors the pests. This one produces very little. So it doesn't favor a lot of thrips build up. Some thrips will get in here. There's enough pollen for aureus to like. So it feeds on the pollen. The thrips feed on the pollen. And the aureus feeds on the thrips. But the, the thrips population will not balloon like it will in the great big uh, sunflower headed uh, uh, flower and plants. Those you don't want in your field. Those will attract way too many thrips. Okay. Uh, there's two things in this picture that tell me I'm probably not going to treat these aphids. These are aphid pests. Do you see the two general things that are different? It's this one and this one right here. These are called mummified aphids. And what happens is a wasp comes along. This is your parasite right there. Lays an egg in the aphid. Egg hatches inside the aphid. And the wasp larvae eats the aphid from the inside out. Then it pupates inside the aphid. And then comes out of the pupil case. And it's an adult. And so it has chewing mouth parts now. And it chews a hole into the aphid, pops this open, and it emerges. And starts the whole cycle over again. And depending on the wasp species, uh, they can uh, parasitize anywhere from 100 to 400 aphids in a lifetime. So once you start seeing something like this, this is about the size, next to my thumb, of a, a bloated aphid of a mummified aphid. They're easy to spot. They're the only thing that won't be moving, and they'll be brown and large like this. Very easy to see amongst all the other aphids that are usually green or black or red. Okay? So that's what you want to look for. Okay, this particular uh, natural enemy is one that's very common. I never realized how common it was, so I started working with it about eight years ago. Anybody want to guess what this is? Is it All right, you can't answer anymore. I'm <laughs> waiting. <laughs> this is a tachinid. Very good. What, again, what tipped you off? That, that kind of what it was. Just the gestalt of it. OK. I'm, a, I'm having an amount degree, so a lot of years looking through my microscopes out. Very good. Very good. Uh, most of them, or a lot of them, look like uh, houseflies on steroids. They look very big and strong. And they, they got these CD on the back end, on their butts. That, and those are the two major things that you look for for this group. And what they'll do is before, they'll go up and lay an egg. But instead of this egg being internal inside the pest, it's external. And so you'll actually see the eggs on the whatever it is, caterpillar or a, a other adult. And they're about the size of a rice grain. So if you think of a rice grain that somebody took and glued it to an insect, that's about the size that you'll see. And so these things are easy to spot. And you usually spot them up around the head. Not all the time, but they're often laid around the head of caterpillars and other bugs. And why do you think they lay the eggs around the head? Didn't know this is going to be a quiz, did you? Because mm -hmm. they can't chew them off. The prey can't chew them off. Oh my God, you're good. Yes. I usually go through a little uh, pantomime up here about what happens, but that's exactly right. If I, if I were a young caterpillar, and I used to be many years ago. <laughs> And somebody laid an egg right down here, and I was young. I could reach down there and crush it with my mouth part. What's the only place on my body I cannot reach with my mouth parts? Your neck. Right, right around my head. So the reason I'm pointing this stuff out to you is because things just don't happen circumstance 
in nature. They happen oftentimes, very often, if not most time, for a reason. So the eggs are located in places where the host cannot get to them. And so that's where you want to look for these eggs. And if you look for these, you'll find, start to see them on caterpillars. Okay? I guarantee you, if you start looking for them, you'll see them on caterpillars. Now they'll start, they hatch from the, the base of the egg directly into the caterpillar. So they do not crack open and you see them open. So they stay sealed like this and they're probably already inside this caterpillar. Okay, this is Trichopoda penipes. It's a, a type of uh, fly, a uh, tachanid, that we just talked about. Uh, it's called a feather-footed fly, as you can see by uh, the little feathers here. And the reason I point this one out more so than others, it looks a little bit different, but this is the one you'll find in uh, vine fields, uh, cucurbit fields. <coughs> they like going after squash bugs. They like going after stink bugs. And they'll lay eggs on these stink bugs. They're very easy to spot. Two wings, an orange abdomen, and smoky dark wings. There's nothing much else that looks like them. And there's usually pretty, uh, a, a large number of them by the time you reach uh, late July, August in a vine field. Okay? And you see the one egg that's been overposited on the head of this uh, bug. Okay. All right, now I'm going to start talking about pests. Anybody have any questions about natural enemies? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about pests both in high tunnels and outside in the field. The pests are about the same. It's that sometimes in high tunnels, uh, the pests are a lot worse. And there's a few of them that will become a lot worse in high tunnels than out in the field. And so I'll just point those out to you. Okay, the first one I'm going to talk about, the first group are worms. And this is yellow striped army worm. And you see by how it gets its name, the two yellow stripes. And then it has these black little triangles on either side. Those are the keys with distinguishing this particular species in the field. Now, they come in different colors and different shades. This is an ideal one that I found in my tomatoes. And they do this type of damage to the tomato. It looks like a hornworm damage, and I'll show you hornworm here in a little bit. It doesn't go into the fruit and then go in and then come back out of the fruit. It scars the outside of the fruit. Okay? So that fruit right there is ruined. There's nothing you can do about it once the larvae start to feed on it like that. So these guys used to be something that were somewhat interesting five, six, seven years ago. I remember 10, 15, about 15 years ago, we found one of these in our field and we didn't know what it was. We had never seen it before. So we contacted somebody down south who had seen lots of them. So this is a southern pest. And now it's moving up more consistently year after year into our area. It can't overwinter here, doesn't like it, but it will move up and it's moving up more quickly each year. So we used to see it in uh, August and then we started seeing it at the end of July, then early July. Now we're starting to see it in June. So these guys can be bad because they're oftentimes resistant to pyrethroids. So you could be out there, once you get worms about this size, they're hard to kill even with a pyrethroid. So you could be spraying two or three times and still not be able to knock these down. There. The other one that's sort of a, becoming more of a big pest, this is beet armyworm. And beet armyworm uh, can come in a lot of different shades, dark uh, shades and lighter shades. And so that black spot that you see right here, it's on the second thoracic segment, on the second leg from the head. So here's the head, first leg, second leg, there's that black spot, and that's what you look for to identify beet armyworm. Why is it important to identify these two worms? Because they're both highly resistant 
to pyrethroids and, and several other insecticides. So you could be out there again spraying two or three times or unfortunately some people spray pyrethroids on a weekly basis as insurance and these worms will get through that. <coughs> so that's why you need to see if you have these worms out in your field or not. Okay. Hey, everybody recognize this one? Okay, this is hornworm. This is actually tobacco hornworm. And they get to be very large, and you think, man, these are going to be easy to spot, but they're not. I've gone out to fields with a grower, and they can't understand why the plants are being defoliated. And we walk out in the field, and we can find 20 of these on the plants. Look for the frass. Look for the frass. Look for the frass. Very large frass, very dark. I don't want to get any pictures of it, Bob. This is what it can look like in the field. This is what type of damage they do. They get near the fruit. Sort of like yellow striped army worm, but uh, much more so. But they'll just defoliate a field, and people don't realize it till it's too late. Even if they don't feed on the fruit, once it's defoliated this much, that plant's not going to produce anything. It's not going to be able to recover. So you need to start looking for these early on. They're worse in high tunnels. So if you're looking at high tunnels, you have high tunnels. I'm not sure exactly what it, well, I think it's two or three different things. Uh, one, once that, it's a very large moth that gets in the high tunnel and it has a hard time getting out. So it's just gonna start laying eggs like crazy. Lots of eggs. That's number one. Number two, the larvae are normally, let's see if I, oh, I don't have a picture of it. Larvae are normally parasitized by parasites. And in the field, they usually don't make it to uh, this large size. They're killed before that. But in the high tunnel, the, the parasitoids take more time to locate them. They eventually will locate them, but only after they've done this type of, type of damage. And so you need to catch them early. Okay. You wouldn't need to catch all these larvae early. I should emphasize that. And what's early? Does anybody recognize what this is? Okay, it's your first key thing to use to tell you have small worms in there. Okay, this is called window painting. Because if you hold it up to the light, it looks sort of like a window pane. What that tells me, without even looking, is that there are caterpillars that are so small that they can't chew through the top epidermal layer of the plant. They chew on the underside of the leaf where it's softer. They consume that, but they can't chew through this. That's this. a good symptom for dying back moth. Okay. And, and cold cross. Exactly. And so you look for that window painting. It tells you you have small worms. And that's when you want to do something. Okay. Apply some kind of insecticide or if you want some kind of biological control. But I go with an insecticide. And we'll go over those, what some of those are. Now once you start seeing this, what does that tell you? Very good, I heard bigger. And so the worm is getting bigger and now can chew through the leaf. And so you need to make a decision pretty quick here of treating or not treating. If you let it go much longer, it's gonna to get too big to treat easily with an insecticide. Okay, these are some of the insecticides. I have pyrethroids down here at the bottom. Not because they're bad or they don't work. They may not work on some of these larvae, but I like to save pyrethroids till later in the season. I don't like to use them early up front in the season. They cause too many problems by wiping out too many natural enemies that we went over. These two you can use organically if you're into sustainable organic uh, production. They need to go on almost like you put on a fungicide. They really need to be there before the worm gets even started. Uh, when I grew broccoli and cauliflower, 
as long as I put that on before I even had the worms and stayed on a regular schedule, I never had a problem. The BT? The BT. Okay. And you had to make sure the BT was, wasn't stored improperly, if you know what I mean. So Bob makes good points there. Uh, if you have BT that's been stored over the years, you want to make sure it's still viable. I tend to get BT, I use up the ones I, I have one year and buy a new set, a new new chemicals the next year. Okay. Now in trust, there's a little more of a chemical. This is, is does anybody know what BT is? If I see enough head shaking, I won't go into it. Okay, I see enough. Uh, Radiant and in trust is more of a chemical and not a biological. And depending on how it's produced, if it's produced organically, it's called in trust. I use in trust all the time instead of uh, the, the synthetic form of radiant. Uh, and it works real well. So this is something that will kill worms and it'll even get medium sized, even sometimes large worms. Right. Now these are others that have different uh, modes of action. And if you run into problems and your pyrethroids aren't working, switch to one of these or even one of these because these will work well. And on beet armyworm, uh, BT has, has been found to work real well, even when they're, they're highly resistant to the pyrethroids. Okay. Any questions? That works because the spore of the, uh, the thing in it acts like a, uh, like they swallowed a real sharp razor blade. Yes, it, it, guts, it cuts up their guts. It needs to be there before they start feeding. Yeah. In order to pick up the dipel or the centauri or the BT, they need to chew the leaf. So you might see some leaf chewing. Then it takes three or four days before the larvae actually die. So this is one reason I think people, yeah, they're, they're, they're a little hesitant about using it. They like to see dead worms hanging from the, the leaf. Makes them feel better after about 24 hours. But this, like BT, will take three or four days before you start to see dead worms. So just be aware of that. It's going to take a while. But they'll stop feeding once they eat a little bit of the uh, dipelvis and tie the bacteria and they get it in their guts. It starts to kill them. Okay, everybody recognize this pest? Okay, two-spotted spider mites. This has become, every year, I'm surprised by when I see this pest. It's become more and more of a problem. Even uh, a year ago, when we had all that rain, when all it did was rain, 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 which makes this, uh, it makes uh, this uh, particular pest does not like a lot of rain. Oftentimes it's washed off. Uh, the real high humidity uh, allows uh, fungal, uh, fungi to attack the mites and actually uh, kill them. And so a lot of rain usually means we don't have much of a problem with two-spotted spider mites. And yet I was surprised when I went out in people's fields and I found two-spotted spider mite problems, even after all that rain. This is the adult, and you see how it gets its name, these two spots right here. They're red eyes, usually you don't see them that clearly. This is the eggs. And so this is what you want to look for. You want to look for the adults any nymphs and these eggs. Because the eggs are highly resistant to most of the chemicals, especially the harder chemicals, the pyrethroids. Pyrethroids aren't going to kill the eggs. And they're oftentimes not going to even kill the adults. This is a pretty bad damage here. And what happens is the mites feed on the chlorophyll, they suck the chlorophyll up, and they just leave the white tissue behind. Now what? Jerry, yeah. With the use of fungicides in some of these crops, we're not creating the mites being healthier because we're taking care of some of the funguses that would knock them out. It might be, Bob. I, uh, uh, I always want to look at that, where I spray fungicides, where I don't, and see if I have any episodic episodes where I don't spray fungicides, but never seem to see that as much as I thought I would. Uh, this is when you know you have problem with two-spotted spider mites. And when you start to see the webbing, like this. 
Because what's happening in this, let's say this is the leaf, this is the bottom of the leaf. The mites are on the bottom of the side of the leaf, underside of the leaf, I should say. They spin their little cocoons, their, their webbing, and that puts a little layer right here, and they're in between that leaf layer and that uh, spin of the silk. And so it's almost impossible to get any kind of miticide or any kind of insecticide up against the mite underneath that leaf. Okay. And so once they start to do this, and they do this as a group, and protect themselves from predators and from sprays, that it's going to be really hard to control them. These can be really bad in high tunnels. And one of the reasons why they're so bad in high tunnels is because we don't have any rain. And so the leaves don't get wet. You don't have any epizoatic episodes. That means the fungus doesn't start growing on one. It comes up, it sprouts, it releases spores. The spores are released all over the place. If it's wet, they start to germinate on the insects again. They start to germinate, and then you just have this explosion of the fungus killing these mites. And you just never see that in a high tunnel. Okay. So in high tunnels, these mites are usually worse. This is uh, oftentimes what they'll look like when they overwinter. They sort of have this orangish color, reddish color to them. They still have the two spots. People often think it's a different species, but it's not. It's still uh, Petranicus urticae. It's just, this is its overwintering look. And they can overwinter in our area uh, pretty easily. These are the adults right here, and this is the predatory mite. Okay. So this mite does look different from these. But if you're looking at it with the naked eye or maybe a 10x hand lens, all you're going to see is orange things running around and they're going to look the same. And my rule of thumb to distinguish these predatory ones from these non-predatory ones is that these guys move much faster. Okay. And they tend to move at right angles. So that predatory mite, if I were to flip over the leaf and look at the little orange dot, the little orange dot would move like this. Okay. These guys have a tendency to move like this. They don't move very fast. They're, they're not in a hurry about anything. That's because they don't have to catch the prey. The predator does. And so that's the way I, rule of thumb, I use. And it works uh, fairly well to know whether you got uh, predators or not there. You can see the stippling effect on the leaves, these little white dots. This is where the mites have removed chlorophyll from the leaf. And you'll see this on the top of the leaf, even though the mites are on the underside. Although this is getting so bad that the mites are starting to come. You see these little dots right here and here. They're starting to come to the top of the leaf. Again, it's like when you start seeing silk. Once you see them start coming to the top of the leaf, you've got real problems. You need to do something in the next 24 hours. You need to get some kind of spray out. Or within about a week or two, it's going to look like this. And there's no hope for that. If I had that in a high tunnel, I recommend, and that's what I did here, that the grower pull it out, put it in a plastic bag, and get rid of it. You cannot save this plant from mites. And all it's going to do is be a nursery for the other uh, infestations in that high tunnel. And it was like 20 plants that they had to get rid of. And that grower did not want to do that, but he finally did. And we were able to get his mite population under control. But we never would have if he left those plants. So sometimes you've got to make sacrifices like that. I know nobody wants to, but when it gets this bad, there's just nothing else you can do. Okay. All right, this is a, another mite. It's not the two-spotted spider mite. In older leaves, it causes the older leaves to curl around like this. In the younger leaves, it causes them to deform like this. So it almost looks like some kind of 2,4-D uh, damage on that new growth. And it causes a strange uh, crinkling of the leaves like that. This is tomato russet mite. This is almost always in high tunnels. It's rarely in the field. 
But again, it's one of these things I'm seeing more and more over the last four or five years in high tunnels where I've never seen it before. And now it's starting to show up. They're basically microscopic. You can't see them with a 20x hand lens, if you know what you're looking for. People say this cigar shaped. It doesn't look cigar shaped to me at all. It looks wedge shaped, okay? So here's the head, and this is its back end. It's got four legs, not the eight like they usually have. And this is the head end, this is the back end. You can see one here up close. But this is probably about a 40x magnification right here. So they're hard to see, and that's why nobody recognizes them. You can't see them. You'll see this damage. And so people will put on extra. Uh, 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 put on extra nutrients or something like that. And it helps a tiny bit, but not much. And they can't figure out why it's not helping control this particular mite. And they're difficult. And it's one of these things that if you're not used to it, you're, you're never going to be able to see it. So it's just something to watch for. These are the different uh, chemicals that you can use. Uh, these are all good at uh, two-spot spider mites, these miticides. This cane mite is good on uh, russet mites. But I recommend you try horticultural oils. Uh, I've been using them for years, and they work really well if you get good coverage. And the good coverage is the underside of the leaf. And the horticultural oils, you probably only need to apply them two or three times, and maybe these chemicals only once. But horticultural oils are usually pretty cheap, so it's not going to cost you. It's going to cost you usually less than putting on one uh, good miticide. But they'll do a good job of killing the mites, the adults, and also get the eggs. So that's a valuable thing. And they don't disrupt uh, most of your other uh, biological control that's going on. Yes? Do you see any problem with that, the finish on the, the vegetable or the tomato? Or oh, the tomato? On some of them, yeah. If it's hot, so let's say it's dry and you're starting to harvest or you're getting at the end of harvest, maybe it's June and your high tunnel's real hot, there can be a problem with that with some of them. The citric ones, the ones that are citrus based, I seem to have more problem that with that, with the burn, than the other plant-based ones. Okay. But the citric, uh, the ones that are citrus based also smoke the mites really well. Mm -hmm. And so the growers tend to like that a lot, and so they tend to go that way. So it's one of those things that you have to weigh the, whether or not you're going to get a burn on your tomatoes or not. Okay. You have the time, Bob. Uh, Jerry, it's uh, 20 o, quarter o, something. Okay. These are flips. Luckily, you can see these guys. This is the type of damage they do. This is the newer growth right here. They'll start to deform that. But if you flip it over, you'll be able to see thrips. They're orange. They're elongated. Sometimes they're a little yellowish orange, but they're elongated. And uh, once you start to stir them, they, they'll start to move pretty quickly. Uh, this is tomato. And these little dimples you see right here are over position marks made by thrips. Now, this one's ridiculous, of course. This is a lot of thrips we've gotten here. But when you start to see these dimples, that's a telltale sign that you have thrips out in your tomatoes. And what's at the base of this are, is a thrips egg. So they make the little dimple and they put the, the egg right there. For western flower thrips, and you do not want western flower thrips, and we have western flower thrips in our area. I found that western flower thrips will overwinter in our area. We didn't think they would, but they do. Western flower thrips are notorious for being resistant to most of the chemicals we spray on them. 
So that's why you don't want them to build up in your greenhouse or in your high tunnel or in the field. And they will build up either place, especially if you use pyrethroids consistently. They will build up. But they make the overposition mark you see here, but they also make this white mark. It's called a halo spot on the fruit. Not all the time, but probably about 50, 60% of the time, they make this halo spot, this white area associated with the dimple. Okay. Only western flower thrips do this. The other species of flower thrips don't do that. Okay. So if you start seeing that, you know you have real problems. Okay. The other thing they'll tell you you have thrips as opposed to mites or something else. You see the thrips feeding damage right here, all these white marks, the stippling. But you see the little black spots. Okay, these are feces. These are the thrips feces. And so that's what you're looking for, the little black spots along with the white feeding marks. Okay. Very telltale sign that thrips are present. Even if you, you don't even need to see them to know that they're there. Okay, the other thing that they'll transmit is a virus, tomato spotted wilt virus. This is not a big deal in our area. You see it, I usually see it every year, usually in July, August, September. It usually waits, gets through the year. It's not a big problem. But it's, it's something that could be, again, to a high tunnel if a couple of thrip species get loose. You have one plant that's infested with the virus. They pick it up and start to spread it in the high tunnel. Less so in the field. But it can happen in the field. All right, why are these mice species, all these mice species and thrips, uh, such a problem over the last couple of years? This is a high tunnel, and that's my foot there. And this is February. And you see this weed, this is chickweed. Okay, I found that the mites and the thrips can overwinter on this chickweed. Chickweed didn't die over the winter, neither will they if they have this. So this grower, as you can see, this is outside, this is inside, did not clean up this high tunnel at the end of last season. He's going to clean it up in a few weeks and he's going to put his first transplants into the ground. And that's not enough time between when these plants are destroyed and when the fresh plants go in. You need, uh, I like to have a month between when these weeds are gone for good. A month later, you're going to start planting in this high tunnel. If they're too close together, the thrips and the mites will survive that time period and they'll start to move on to your plants as soon as you get them in there. And then you've got some real problems. They don't usually grow very quickly because it's really cold at first, but as the plant grows more and gets the heat, so do the mites and the thrips. So this is one of the problems, this overwintering on chickweed. The other one, and this is a huge range from 3 to 60% of transplants. So I'd go to growers' fields when they got the transplants from wherever they shipped them from, and we inspected them over the, the um, period of time, to just a couple of years ago. And what I found that they either had mites or thrips, or most of the time they had mite eggs or thrips eggs on these transplants. And these are the thrips eggs, and they're embedded in the leaf tissue. You're not going to see this. But these are going to hatch, and then you're going to have thrips. And people always wonder, where do these come from? And oftentimes, they're coming from these transplants. Okay. And so that's one of the things you got to pay attention to. A lot of times I didn't find any adults on the transplants, but I found the eggs. And the eggs, if it's cold, will last a week to 10 days. Okay, why is it such a problem? This is one example of a high tunnel growing uh, transplants. It's pretty nice they got it up off the ground, but do you see what's underneath the transplants? Weeds. weeds. Now, I'm hoping they did a good job of cleaning up these weeds before they started, but a lot of times they haven't. They've done an okay job. And so these weeds are probably infested with mites or thrips. They're just going to bounce right up 
and then go right out the door. Okay. The other thing is when they start to grow the flowers in the same high tunnel or same greenhouse with these transplants. These flowers are notorious for developing thrips. And as you move from one area to the other, the thrips get on your sleeves without realizing it, and you distribute them into the vegetable growing area. So we strongly recommend you do not grow both these in the same greenhouse. It's either all vegetables or it's all transplant, house tr uh, flower transplants. And that you clean up underneath your benches. They at least had the benches off the ground, so that's good. Some of these are on the ground, and so they have a tendency to have more problems than the ones up off the ground. Okay, <clears throat> the pyrethroids and neonics. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot to co combat these. This is probably the other trouble uh, with a lot of these, especially the thrips. Uh, radiant or entrust, even the organic stuff, works real well on thrips. The, the thing you have to check is uh, find out what the, uh, the greenhouse is using to control their thrips in that greenhouse. Oftentimes, it is radiant or in trust that they've been spraying every other week or every week. If they have been doing that, you do not want to use that again. You want to use one of these if you start to see mites or thrips. Okay. All right. These are aphids. Aphids are really neat creatures. I really like them. They're more of a pain for things like this, lettuces and things like that, because they get down into the leaves, and it is freaking difficult to clean this up once they get down into the leaves like that. So you, you try not to let them get started. That's the thing. Once they get started, they produce a sooty mold, which could really make things ugly. You're not going to be able to sell any of your produce. The other thing is they transmit viruses. And depending on when they hit the plant with a virus, if the plant has not developed its fruit, has not started fruiting, and it gets hit with a virus, it will not fruit. It will stop fruiting. It will not develop any fruit. Now, sometimes we get hit with a virus, and it's pretty mild like this and the plant may push through. When it gets to this stage, it's a little bit harder, virus uh, in infection, and so it's, it'll stop producing fruit. Now, this is really bad. This is what I've often found when I've taken uh, samples of this and send off to see what virus it is. It's two or three different viruses in the plant at the same time. And that's because the aphids come and they feed on the plant and they inject the virus into the plant. And another aphid comes from another area with another virus, injects that into the plant. And so then you have this leaf that is really deformed. Yes? What's the best way to dispose of that plant? Uh, I would probably pull it up and put it in a plastic bag. Um, Usually there's not uh, a lot of movement from the aphids that are on the plant to other plants in the field. It's mostly aphids coming into the field over time. It's not so much an internal spread of the viruses. It can be. But this isn't going to produce anything once it gets to this point. It's just going to suck up your water and your nutrients. Okay. So you got the neonicotinoids that work pretty well. Now each of these are a different uh, chemistry. And so if something doesn't work, think about using something else. The reason people don't usually use these that I'm showing you right here, because they're expensive. And they don't like expensive. But they work real well. Uh, NAC is an IGR. And it'll take four or five days before you start to see aphids dying. Okay. It's an insect growth regulator. So it won't do anything to adults, but it, it'll kill all the immatures. And most of the aphids you'll see on a plant are immature. Fulfill, again, will take a couple of days, because what it does, it paralyzes the uh, feeding uh, apparatus of the aphids. They become paralyzed. They stop feeding. 
and the poor little thing starved to death. And so that takes four or five days before you start to see him dying. You don't see him dying right away. And people don't like that. They like to see him dying. Uh, insecticidal soap actually works pretty decently. Again, it's the coverage. If you want to go sustainable ag or organic, and, and get that under the underside of the leaf where the aphids are, it'll do a pretty good job of cleaning them up. It won't kill them all, but you'll still have some present, but it'll get most of them. Okay, this is striped cucumber beetle. And the reason it's such a big pest is because of this right here. Okay, that's their poop. And in the poop is a Rhinia tracheophila, and that's a bacterium that once it gets inside the plant of cucurbits, it multiplies very rapidly, and it cho chokes the plant basically, and it dies of wilt. And so what happens is the beetles chew a hole into the plant. The bacteria can't get into the plant unless it has a hole like this. The beetle poops right around the hole. The bacteria move from the poop into the hole very easily. And so that's when you get a lot of bacteria wilt show up. Not right away. It can take anywhere from two to six weeks before you see that plant wilt. And so a lot of times people see a plant wilt and they think, oh, that, that happened, it, it got bit by a beetle two weeks ago or a week ago. No, it probably got uh, contaminated with feces about a month ago. So it has to have this feeding and it has to have the poop. This only happens usually about one, one time during the season. And that's this time. And that's the mating frenzy feeding. That's when they first start to come out from the overwinter along woods, uh, on the edges of woods, and then they start to come into a field. They'll consistently come into the same area of a field if you have your, uh, your curcubits there. And what they do is they start to feed on the plant. They release volatiles from the plant. They also release pheromones from their bodies. So the pheromones and the plant volatiles call to other beetles and then they all start to come. Once that happens, once they start to come, you cannot stop that. All you can do is kill the beetles. Okay? So if you're doing, trying to control this organically, that's why organic growers have such a hard time controlling the beetles. Because once they start to feed, you can't stop them from coming. And that's what we try to do organically, is stop them from feeding. Okay, this is the type of damage that they can do. They're often located at the base of the plant. And you see all the uh, chewing feeding that they do at the base of the plant. People don't realize that's where they're located. How often do you get a spray down there at the base of a plant? I can tell you it's not very often. You get very little spray down at the base of a plant. So this is uh, some organic plots I had. This uh, white material I'm using is called surround. It's a kaolin clay. It's a clay that I spray out there in a water mix. The water evaporates off and leaves behind the clay. Plants grow in this just fine. Matter of fact, they grow better than the plants that don't have it on it. Okay. I start this as early as I can. So here, I've been building up the clay on these transplants. And, com and I'll compare them with the ones in the field. These always do better in the field than these plants, okay, because of the clay that's on them. And the reason is it's partly that when you put them out in the field, they're shocked. And the clay helps them overcome that shock once you put them in the field from a nice, warm, high tunnel or greenhouse. Okay, the other thing you can use organically are row covers. I don't know why organic growers don't use these more often. They're a pain in the ass, I know. They're a lot of effort, but they'll keep your plants clean of all these pests I just showed you, if you start with clean transplants. And then once flowering commences, you take them off. And by that time, usually curbit, whatever it is, <coughs> can do a good job of sustaining itself against the pest. Okay, these are squash bugs. 
guess what? They like to feed at the base of the plant. You see one squash bug here. They like it so much, they mate down there. They lay eggs in the soil, on the plants, I mean. Uh, these are three of them on one plant. I pulled up, and they refused to get off the plant. And you see how they're devoted to the base of the plant. Where do you want to direct your sprays for these two pests? That's at the base of the plant, not the foliage so much. You want to get some on the foliage, insecticide, but you want to make sure you get the base of the plant covered. This is why this, these guys are hard to control because people don't get the base of the plant where they're hiding. Okay. This is some of the damage they do. They inject enzymes into the plant, causes the leaves to deteriorate like this. Okay, so pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, lanate, if you're really desperate, this is nasty stuff. I don't recommend it unless you're desperate. Seven, you don't want to spray seven if you got any bee activity, if you have any flowers. Do not spray seven. Okay, no seven. It's after, it's before you have any flowers out there. Spray seven. Okay, sprays must reach the base of the plant to be effective. If you don't re reach the base of the plant, if you want to go back out there after a certain amount of time and look at the base of the plant and see if it has any moisture on it, you can do that. Or you can put a uh, 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 moisture sensitive card at the base of your plants to see if they get wetted or not. If you don't have that, you're not going to get control of these pests. You just won't. Okay, these are two newer chemicals. Harvanta for cucumber beetles has shown to work pretty darn well, especially if these others have not. And Savanto for squash bugs, some newer chemicals. Okay, I think that's all. If you have any questions.